Sun City got emergency for you. Alright. Uh, I got a United Aircraft coming in, lost number two engines, having a hard time controlling the aircraft right now. He's at a 29,000 right now, in descent into Sioux City right now. He's east of your VOR, but he wants equipment standing by right now. Uh, radar contact. Okay, so you know we have almost no controllability. Uh, very little elevator and almost no aileron. Uh, we're controlling the turns by power. I don't think we can turn right, but I think we can only make left turns. Well, we're starting a little bit of a left turn right now. I mean, we can only turn right, we can't turn left. United 232 Heavy, uh, understand, sir. Uh, you can only make right turns? That's affirmative. United 232 Heavy, safe souls on board and uh, fuel remaining. We have 37.6 fuel and we're counting the souls. Right. United 232 Heavy, Sioux City. We have no hydraulic fluid, which means we have no elevator control, uh, almost none, and very little aileron control. I have serious doubts about making the airport. Have you got uh, some place near there uh, that we might be able to ditch? Unless we get control of this airplane, we're going to put it down wherever it happens to be. United 232 Heavy, Roger. Uh, stand by one. United 232 Heavy, uh, say again. Here's the airport to us now as we come spinning down here. United 232 uh, Heavy, Sioux City Airport's about 12 o'clock and 3 6 miles. Okay, we're trying to go straight. We're not having much luck. 232. We're going to try to put it in a Sioux City. United 232 Heavy, I understand you're going to try to make it into Sioux City? There's no uh, airports out that way that can accommodate you, sir. Okay, we'll head for Sioux City. We got a little bit of control back there. Only like the runway. United 232 Heavy, the airport, uh, the runway is uh, 9,000 feet long, 150 foot wide. Okay, thank you. And United 232 Heavy, did you get the souls on board, Cal? Nearby. Hey, right now, we don't even have time to let go to call the gal. Uh, Roger. Uh, 292. Roger, thank you. United 232, Evan, do you think you'll be able to hold about a uh, 240 heading? Yeah, okay, we're trying to turn to it right now. Roger. Uh, when you get turned to that uh, 240 heading, sir, the airport will be about, oh, 12 o'clock at 38 miles. Okay, uh... We're trying to uh, control just by power alone now. We have no hydraulics at all, so uh, we're doing our best here. Roger, and uh, we've notified the equipment out in that area too, sir. The equipment's here on the airport standing by, and they're sending some out to that area. Yeah, 232, uh, we're going to have to continue one more right turn. We've got the elevator pretty much under control within three or 400 feet, but we still can't do much of the steering. United 232, heavy, Roger. understand you do have the elevators up possibly under control. We'd better to hold out to. Negative. We don't have it. We uh, are better, that's all. Roger. United 232 Heavy, there is a small airport at 12 o'clock and uh, 7 miles. The runway is 4,000 feet long there. Hey, uh, I'm controlling it myself right now. As soon as Captain gets back on, he'll give me a hand here. He's talking on the PA. Roger. Okay, United 232, we're starting a left turn back to the airport. Uh, we have, since we have no hydraulics, braking is going to really be a problem. Uh, I would suggest the equipment be towards the far end of the runway. And uh, I think under the circumstances, regardless of the condition of the airplane, when we stop, we're going to evacuate. So you might notify the uh, ground crew equipment that we're going to do that. United 232 Heavy, uh, Wilco, sir. And if you can continue that left turn to about a uh, 220 heading, sir, that'll take you right to the airport. 420 now. United 232 Heavy, you're going to have to widen out just slightly to your left, sir, uh, to make the turn to final, and also that'll take you away from the city. Whatever you do, keep us away from the city. United 232 Heavy, been advised there is a four-lane highway uh, up in that area, sir, if you can pick that up. Okay, we'll see what we can do here. We've already put the gear down, and uh, we're going to have to be put on something solid if we can. United 232 Heavy, Roger. Can you pick up a road or something up there? We're trying. It's still uh, anywhere from 2,000 feet up to 1,500 down now in waves. Roger, come on. United 232 Heavy, can you hold that heading, sir? Yeah, we're on it now for a little while. United 232 Heavy, Roger. That heading will put you, oh, uh, currently 15 miles northeast of the airport. If you can hold that, it'll put you on about three mile final. Okay, we're giving it heck. United 232 Heavy, Roger. Uh, the airport's currently at your 1 o'clock position, 1 zero miles. And United 232 Heavy, uh, if you can't make the airport, sir, there is an interstate that runs uh, north to south to the east side of the airport. Uh, it's a four-lane interstate. Okay, 
We're just okay. passing it right now. We're going to cry for the air. United 232, have it, roger. And I'd advise me to get the airport in sight. Got a runway in sight. We'll be with you very shortly. Thanks a lot for your help. United 232, heavy. The wind's currently 360 at 11. 360 at 11. You're cleared to land on any runway. <laughs> you want to be particular and make it a runway, huh? Say the wind one more time. Uh, wind 010 at 11. Okay, we're all three talking at once. Say it again one more time. Uh, zero one zero at one one, and there is a runway uh, that's closed, sir. That could uh, probably work too. The south it runs uh, northeast to southwest. Pretty well lined up on this one, or I think we will be. All right. Get this. United two thirty two heavy. Uh, Roger, sir. Yeah, that's a closed runway. That'll work, sir. We're getting the equipment off the runway, and they'll line up for that one. How long is it? 6,600 feet, 6,600, and the equipment's coming off. At the end of the runway, it's just a wide open field, so, sir, so the length won't be a problem. Okay. Uh, you On July 19, 1989, this accident took 111 lives, but more importantly, 184 people survived. According to Captain Al Haynes, the pilot in command of the crippled DC-10 aircraft, the very high survival rate was possible only because of the team effort of the groups involved in handling the emergency. Captain Haynes refused to take the full credit for saving the lives of the 184 surviving passengers. Instead, he emphasized that he was only one of thousands who assisted in the survival effort. Of course, it took a highly skilled pilot to coordinate the team. But all pilots should be aware that the same resources and assistance provided to United Airlines Flight 232 is available to us as well. Many resources are available on request. In years past, the term cockpit resource management referred to the pilot's ability to logically arrange his charts, plotters, and other required items in the order of their expected use. It seemed to limit the pilot's resources to only those in the physical cockpit. It is so much more, as we will see. According to Dr. Alan Deal, Human Performance Technical Advisor to the Air Force Safety Agency, investigations into the causes of aviation accidents have shown that judgment errors associated with cockpit management are a contributing factor in the majority of the incidents and accidents. Long-term research has demonstrated that these events share common characteristics. Many problems encountered in flight have very little to do with the technical aspects of operating an aircraft. Instead, poor decision-making, ineffective communication, inadequate command actions, and poor task or resource management are associated with the problems. Pilot training programs have historically focused almost exclusively on the technical aspects of flying and on the individual's piloting skills. The training did not effectively address resource management issues that are fundamental to a safe flight. Perhaps a good definition of cockpit resource management would be the effective use of all available resources needed to complete a safe and efficient flight. These resources may include assistance from other individuals, the capabilities of airborne or ground equipment, or the dissemination of information available to us. Effective cockpit resource management, or CRM, is much more than keeping a well-organized cockpit. It involves an awareness and knowledge of the resources that are available to assist pilots in the decision-making process. CRM encompasses everything we do to achieve safe and efficient flight operations, regardless of whether we normally operate single pilot or as a member of a multi-pilot crew. CRM is a valuable tool in developing the team concept in our flying activities. Because flying is a combination of events that require us to make a continuous stream of decisions, it is vital for pilots to develop this team approach to address both the expected and unexpected events that occur in the course of a normal flight. For the next few moments, let's take a look at how effective cockpit resource management can enhance safety for both multi-pilot crews and single pilot operations. We will also take a brief look at how instructors and pilot examiners can promote the use of CRM techniques in the course of everyday flight training and testing. 
In recent years, CRM training has received widespread attention in the training programs of the nation's air carriers. This training was mandated by the FAA through the Federal Aviation Regulations. Although the average general aviation flight department is smaller in scope and size than that of its air carrier counterpart, they share similar operational problems. For this reason, CRM training and procedures should be an integral part of general aviation training programs as well. Effective CRM techniques encompass not only those areas of interest to the individual pilot, but equally important is the human interactions of individuals during multi-pilot operations as well. CRM helps to bring together the humanware, software, and hardware to achieve safe and efficient flight operations. Because individuals bring varied backgrounds and levels of experience to the cockpit, it is important for us to realize that no one individual has all the answers to the numerous decisions that are required in the course of everyday flight operations. Effective problem solving requires that all information, regardless of its source, be considered. A primary goal of cockpit resource management techniques is conflict resolution or problem solving. An essential part of this practice is communication or an open transfer of information between crew members. The ability to communicate effectively with other crew members is a vital link in the CRM process. Let's take a look at how CRM techniques can be used to overcome many of the barriers to effective communication and to establish open communication between crew members. First, a complete briefing is an essential part of our pre-flight duties. This provides an opportunity to develop the team concept and encourages participation from all crew members. This allows the pilot in command to establish standard operating procedures as well as safety and operational issues. The pilot in command can also take advantage of this time to address crew responsibilities as well as duties of the flying and non-flying pilot. It is important to remember that all crew members, not just the flight deck crew, should be included in this discussion. Secondly, it is important to keep all crew members in the decision-making loop. Participation by all crew members in the decision-making process should be encouraged. This allows each crew member to share in overall progress of the flight and to maintain his or her situational awareness. When all input is considered and a decision made, it should be clearly stated and acknowledged by each member of the crew. Resource management in the cockpit also should involve how those resources are being used. Workload management is an important consideration in the CRM process. This allows for the crew responsibilities to be established in such a way as to be more evenly distributed. The pilot in command can play an important role in minimizing the potential of excessive workload on crew members by prioritizing the tasks to be accomplished and delegating the tasks evenly among crew members. Each crew member should actively monitor activities in the cockpit to maintain their situational awareness, as well as to monitor the workload level of other members of the crew. We have reviewed several examples of good cockpit resource management practices. It is just as important to point out, however, what CRM is not. FAR 91.3 states that the pilot in command is directly responsible for and is the final authority as to the operation of that aircraft. CRM is not an infringement on that authority, rather a tool to assist the pilot in fulfilling his obligation to carry out his flight operations in a safe and efficient manner. CRM encompasses the team building approach to problem solving. Better teamwork results in better communication, crew coordination, and problem solving. Working together to accomplish multiple complex tasks safely. That is what cockpit resource management is all about. As anyone knows, the multi-pilot cockpit is the ideal situation. However, many of us fly small general aviation aircraft that are designed for single pilot operation. In this situation, you may be the only one in the aircraft who knows anything about flying, weather, or communication. However, you are not alone. There are many resources available to you. They range from the many publications, such as charts, airport facility directories, and the AIM, to the various FAA air traffic facilities on the ground along your flight path. Let's look a little more closely at some of them. One of the first things available to you are the many safety seminars like this one that are held by the FAA and other safety-minded aviation organizations. Anytime you have the chance to enhance your skills through additional training, you have just added another resource to your bag of aviation tools. 
Next, flight information publications are a valuable source of help. It just takes one time to need a current chart for a good frequency before you realize this. These are available from a variety of groups such as AOPA, Jepson Sanderson, and NOAA. The Airman's Information Manual is another good source of valuable information. You should realize that the information in the AIM is constantly under revision and your copy should be current. How up are you on your ability to get up to the minute weather information? One of the biggest changes underway is the consolidation of the flight service stations into the automated flight service stations. New technology such as computerization of information is allowing for new services to be offered. HIWAS, AWOS, TIBS, Fast File, and a host of other resources are available to assist a single pilot in the safe operation of an aircraft. Do you know what these are? Do you know how to effectively use them? If you don't, then contact your local AFSS to set up a tour to learn what is available. Air traffic control is another resource that is sometimes overlooked because of fear of the radio or sometimes the pilot doesn't want to appear foolish. Some of the great resources available include radar traffic advisories, automatic broadcast of SIGMETs, and flight following, workload permitting. In emergencies, AFSS have the DF steer, which can be used to locate aircraft and offer assistance in reaching a safe landing site. ATC radar facilities can also be used in an emergency. A great resource available in the aircraft is the Pilot Operating Handbook, or POH. Anytime you are in an aircraft that is new to you, or in which you have less than 10 recent hours, you should take a quick look over the material in the POH so that if you need to know something in a hurry, you can get to it quickly. Be familiar with the equipment installed in the aircraft. This is an area of growing importance as the speed and sophistication of aircraft increases and availability of navigational equipment such as LORAN and GPS increases. Many of us rely on autopilots. They too are a resource. Do not overlook the value of local knowledge at unfamiliar airports. Many transient pilots have come to grief because of a local hazard that was overlooked or that they were not aware of. This sort of help is available from the FBO and local pilots. Probably you have used all of the things that I have mentioned, some more than others. You have done this without conscious thought that you were using resources. I would suggest that you think in terms of using all the items mentioned as a single concept. Cockpit Resource Management By unifying the resources, you will greatly enhance the safety of operation of your aircraft. From the previous discussions, you've seen examples of how effective cockpit resource management practices can be in both single and multi-pilot operations. It should come as no surprise then that CRM is also beneficial during the course of basic and advanced flight training, as well as during the FAA practical test. An applicant for an airman certificate or rating is expected to display good decision-making skills by effectively using the resources available to him. These resources may include ATC or AFSS services, aircraft avionics and systems, charts and publications, and yes, even the pilot examiner. The examiner is expected to set the guidelines for the flight prior to boarding the aircraft. The examiner is a professional and should set the tone for CRM practices to be used throughout the flight. The examiner will, however, leave room for the applicant to display and expand his or her own CRM skills during the flight. Let's listen in on a portion of this examiner's pre-flight briefing. See if you can recognize the areas relating to proper CRM practices. First of all, you understand that you are pilot in command on the airplane. Yeah. I'm not free to give advice. I'm strictly a passenger for the flight today. I'd like for you to call out to me any observed traffic that you see. I'll do the same thing for you. Make sure we both know who's operating around us. Let's talk about emergencies for a minute. If I give you any simulated condition, I'm going to announce it. If we have an actual emergency, remember you are pilot in command, you handle the appropriate procedures. I will not take over the aircraft unless I think either what you're doing or failing to do is jeopardizing our safety. I'd also like to remind you of the FAA's discontinuation policy. You may stop a check ride at any time without any prejudice that it's going to be a tougher exam because I have to come back out. Any questions on these policies at all? No. Okay. Although the use of proper CRM techniques is very beneficial to the examiner, it is essential that the applicant be comfortable with them as well. 
The FAA practical test standards states that the examiner will observe that equipment and materials are well organized and properly arranged, and that occupants are briefed on the use of safety equipment and emergency procedures. The applicant can establish proper CRM techniques early during the practical test by making specific requests of the examiner. Let's listen in again on our practical test applicant as he initiates good CRM procedures with the pilot examiner. Todd, those are the practices I want to use today to while we conduct the flight. Do you have any questions or additional comments? Yeah, if I could, I'd like to ask that you uh, assist me in, during clearing turns for seeing and avoiding traffic. Okay. Also, um, when I'm under the hood, I'll let you know which direction we're turning prior to making the turn. That's a good idea. And if air traffic control um, calls out traffic and you don't see it and I don't see it, um, I'll ask for vectors around traffic. Okay. Also, when we have an emergency, I'd like to ask you to pull out the uh, checklist, turn to the appropriate page, and then um, squawk 7700. Todd, don't you think that would be the pilot's responsibility to find the appropriate check? Obviously, certain requests of the examiner would not be appropriate. If a request cannot be honored by the examiner, he will specify at that time why he cannot comply with the request. It is obvious that good CRM practices are an important part of piloting skills, and one that is being evaluated on the practical test. Examiners set the tone for the flight, and the applicant should continue by displaying the judgment developed during their flight training experience. As you can see, we can all benefit from good CRM practices. It only requires some preparation and the desire to participate in open communications. There must always be a pilot in command, but all those involved in the flight must be vigilant and participate.